And thanks so much for being with us today. It's a real pleasure. Uh, thanks for uh, Global Korea and the UN Foundation. Uh, I really look forward to this amazing program, and, and thanks for having us kick you off. So Marek, as many of you know, is the uh, Director of Strategic Partnerships at Brookings and also leads the Global Cities Initiative. And before that, I believe you've worked for years, really, with uh, cities, with municipalities, on trying to get them to become more competitive in a global a marketplace. Uh, now, when you talk about global cities, you're not just talking about uh, uh, the uh, New Yorks of the world, London, Paris. What are you really talking about? Right, I think that the traditional view of global cities over the past several years has been these financial hubs or these world capitals. And in reality, our view is that every city can be and should be a global city and be globally fluent or globally engaged. There are lots of different factors that are driving this. In the United States in particular, we've been very insular in our economic development and economic growth patterns and our approach to job creation and support. Um, it's been very easy because of the size of our market and various other factors that we can talk about. But from, again, from our view, global cities is, being a global city is accessible to any city. We can speak specifically about a couple of places which you certainly wouldn't consider to be global or aren't even internationally recognized. One is Greenville and Spartanburg in South Carolina. They have per capita the highest amount of foreign direct investment. And in Wichita, another city that you go to Brazil, well, actually in Brazil, they may recognize Wichita because of the aerospace industry, but you go, Wichita has the highest intensity of exports that are driving their economy. So it is not just Chicago, Los Angeles, Mexico City, Singapore. It is mid-tier cities, smaller cities, as long as they have this approach toward global fluency and are deliberately taking steps toward certain traits that integrate them into the global economy or make them better positioned for international economic connections and competitiveness. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned trades. So what are some of those trades that these cities need to have in order to become global? Well, funny you should ask that question because <laughs> uh, about a year ago, we actually at Brookings went through a process of evaluating more than 40 cities, domestic and international, to try and identify some of the categories of, of um, characteristics that enabled them to be globally connected. And we came up with 10. This is not an evaluation mechanism. It is not a, uh, an in-depth data analysis. It is a framework for people to think a little bit differently, decision makers, economic developers, policy makers, um, about what are the elements of global uh, engagement and global fluency that are important to consider. And so we published this report called The 10 Traits of Globally Fluent Metropolitan Areas. Um, and I can talk a little bit about those characteristics. I think one important factor to start off with is, as a baseline, that we are looking at metropolitan areas, cities and their regions, their labor markets, as really driving all economic activity. And when we're thinking about economic growth, oftentimes in terms of international, people are talking nation to nation or they're talking even state to state. Um, they're not talking about cities and their role in international trade. We go back to the Silk Road and Germany and the Hanseatic League and call up all these visions of trading cities. But in reality, our economy in the United States is being driven by these metropolitan areas. You look at the top 100 metro areas, um, it represents 12% of the land area in the United States, represents maybe about a third of the population, but it drives 75% of our GDP. And they drive the vast majority, nearly 90% of our venture capital, our patent production, the concentration of, of educated workforce. They're representing, and we did an analysis of this that you all can also take a look at, in advanced industries. They represent more than 90% of those advanced industries that are really what's motivating economic growth and quality job creation in the United States. Um, so the one premise is that fundamentally we need to be thinking about supporting metro areas, cities and their regions. 
around economic growth strategies that connect them to the global economy. Um, yeah. If I could barge in here um, and play devil's advocate, because yes. that's what I like to do. Does, I mean, you sort of addressed that earlier for a little bit, but uh, does every city really has to have to become global? What's in it for them and what's the alternative? Well, if you look at the, the benefits of trade, simply trade, um, small and medium-sized businesses are actually driving job creation in the United States, particularly the mid-sized businesses. Um, you do an analysis of how mid-sized businesses, both manufacturing and services, did during the heart of our recession. And you see that in the manufacturing sector, their growth rate was nearly 40%, while the decline of, of um, sales and, and, and value in manufacturing SMEs that did not export was more than 7%. That's during the recession. If you look at the services industries, services companies that export um, and are engaged in international trade generate 100% more sales than services companies that don't. They have 70% more employment and pay 20% better wages. So if you look at the activities of these companies and the kinds of, of multiplier effects, spin-offs, and benefits, particularly for jobs, which is really what we're talking about here, great economic strength and how it benefits individuals and addresses some of our income inequality issues. And, and uh, long-term sustainability of our local economies um, and, and how that benefits socio social issues as well. International engagement matters um, for businesses. In addition, um, you can look at foreign direct investment. I mentioned Greenville, Spartanburg areas one, but if you look at uh, companies that have foreign investment, either are foreign owned establishments or have equity investment or other kinds of venture relationships, they are generating a disproportionate amount of economic benefit as well. More research and development, higher wages, and they facilitate international connections for goods and services and are higher growth rates. So this concept of trying to look outward and be involved in the global economy is relevant wherever you are. You can go, and we are working with, currently with 20 places around the country, 20 metropolitan areas in the United States, and interacting with other metros around the world, trying to cultivate these relations, explore what you can do to, to become more globally fluent. Um, we're in Des Moines, Charleston, South Carolina, um, as I mentioned, Wichita, but also in San Antonio, Chicago, LA. All of this is transferable. There are companies in all of these places. There are politi political leaders and universities and civic leaders in all of these places that have been deliberately acting to connect into the international marketplace and also just simply enhance how they are able to compete through innovation, through workforce skills, through infrastructure investments. So it does matter, and anybody can do it. Whether you can, you can't be a Chicago. Chicago's unique. You can't be a Silicon Valley. It's as my colleague Bruce Katz likes to say. It's the the, the great economic development philosopher Dolly Parton. <laughs> quote: Figure out what you do well and do it on purpose. So this all comes back to what you as a region have in your assets and how to build on that. And all of that can connect in some way into the international economy. So as you travel around the country then, what are the biggest impediments that you hear from folks uh, for making that happen? Well, one is the inward focus. Mm. Um, and this is not a natural part of economic development practice or policy in the United States. Our economic development growth model historically in the US has been based on three things. Starbucks, Stadia, and stealing each other's businesses. That really means retail and consumption real estate, public amenities that are not necessarily productive amenities. I don't have a problem with investing in stadiums. You have to understand what the economic outcome and purpose of those stadiums are. They're important for civic culture. You can't build an economy on beer and hot dogs, right? And then finally, stealing each other's businesses. That doesn't mean we should not be investing in attracting new businesses, New, or attracting other investment to grow existing businesses, but it does mean that cannibalizing from within a region is not a productive way to spend our resources and time. The vast majority, as I mentioned earlier, the vast majority of long-term job growth comes from 
the growth of existing companies, typically middle market companies. If you look at trends, and we have nice charts for you to view online, or we can provide based on individual metropolitan areas. Um, on an annual basis, most job creation comes from new firm establishments. Those could be startups, or they could be opening of a, of a new retail store, or something like that, more than 50%. On average, less than 2% comes from site selection activities, business, re business relocations. And then more than 40% comes from that middle ground where you have um, growth of existing companies in your area. Again, middle market companies most often. Over a 10-year time frame, more than 60% on average comes from that middle sector. The greatest job loss comes from, uh, on, a, on, a, on an annualized basis, uh, also comes from those new establishments because they often go out of business. And so you have maybe around 25% of job, sustained job growth coming from those. And then the remainder, which is still a very small percentage relative to the amount of effort that's put in there, coming from business attraction efforts. So this is a question of balance in economic growth uh, models in the United States. Where, and it then relates back to these issues of, of global engagement for your economy. Most of our activities, our investment, is in supporting entrepreneur startup and trying to attract businesses so we can cut ribbons and say, here's 200 jobs, when, in fact, 2,000 jobs are being created by existing companies. You just can't count them. And you can't articulate that clearly um, in terms of business retention and expansion to a lot of supporters in the community. So the natural tendency is toward the old school, let's build a factory. Well, in fact, Building the factories is not where the growth is coming from. And if you look again at that middle section of help, how do you help expand existing companies, that comes from dealing with traded sectors outside the region. And that's where this export, trade, foreign direct investment, global engagement outside of your market resonates and where you're going to get your long-term job creation. So it all comes together around this issue about a balanced approach to economic development that reflects um, where jobs are created what companies need, and how do you enable them through policy and program supports and, um, and eliminating regulatory barriers. So we can talk about, about those specific issues. But fundamentally, it comes from a philosophical problem, a recognition of a change that's needed in e our economic growth model and how we invest our balance, balance approach to investing our resources. So what is then the um, role of the federal government in all of this? Well, each level of government, and we've seen this as we've gone internationally as well, each role, uh, level of government has a different functioning capacity. And I think that it's at least as important, I'll talk about government, but it's at least as important to recognize the role of private sector in this, because it represents more than half of the effort and the endurance when you're talking about these, these strategies of global engagement. Um, as well as universities and other kinds of big civic organizations. So on the, on the public sector side, you know, the federal government obviously sets the rules, has to open markets, facilitate trade, foreign tra uh, free trade agreements, foreign commercial service cannot be replicated, no matter how big state might be. The ability to have presence, market awareness, access for, for um, regions and companies in all of these markets is critical. Federal government collects data and actually has been cutting back on its data collection. Cannot be replicated by any other source, public sector or private sector. Federal government can, can remove some barrier, regulatory barriers or facilitate, you know, trade facilitation, the technical terminology, um, particularly around sectors that really matter. And in, even in North America, where we're co-producing so much in, partic in particular advanced industries, whether it's aerospace or automotive or precision instruments, electronics. The federal government has control over those systems um, and, and, again, that, that presence internationally. Federal government is not good about knowing what company has the greatest export potential in San Antonio. Who knows that? Not even the state of Texas knows that. You know, I see Mayor Nutter and Mayor Strickland from Tacoma, um, and um, uh, they know their businesses, and their chambers of commerce know their businesses, and their economic development organizations know their businesses. 
they have control over their economic development strategies. And those, that, that ability to proactively reach companies and uh, that have the potential to export but aren't thinking about exporting, that fit into your growth strategy for what key industry clusters you are investing your effort to expand on, the Dolly Partonism about you know, what are you doing well? Well, we should focus on that. Um, federal government cannot do that. They can be partners in it. They can provide access to their, their networks and the data and the resources to do that. They can facilitate when you're taking a trade mission. But they are not the source for figuring out who can export effectively, who can trade, how to access those. And in fact, the federal government has constraints. When you're talking about foreign direct investment, federal government, by law, despite the, invest, uh, the effort to expand Select USA, by law, they're constrained. They cannot choose and pick preferences and company comes to them. They can give you a list of contacts around the country about who that company should talk to. They can promote the U.S. generally as a, um, uh, as a, a place where it's good to invest for broad reasons. But they cannot say, oh, well, you're interested in the sustainability sector. Portland is really good at that. You should take a look at Portland. So that's the federal place. State, state can aggregate efforts. They're much closer to um, the, the businesses and the regional economic development organizations. And states have brand names. So no, you, you may not know um, Fresno in California. But California, you know. You, may, you know Los Angeles. You might not know Fresno. Um, and California can help bring together, also at scale, um, as New York is starting to do by urging their various economic regions, about 10 of them, to create these export and trade strategies, can identify where there are commonalities in these economies and bring them together and therefore create cost-effective efforts to do outreach around what their individual regions are good at and they're complementary on internationally. Um, but it's, again, really at that local and regional level where you, the elected officials can catalyze collaboration, and then the private sector has taken on the leadership role in executing and continuing these activities that are helping uh, to generate economic growth. And I can give you examples of those, too, if you would like. Yeah. Well, in fact, I wanted to ask you about one of those. I believe you've been working with Chicago and Mexico City right. to uh, find uh, synapses there to work together more closely. Um, Right. How does that exactly work? So as part of the Global Cities Initiative overall, uh, which involves research and convenings dissemination and, and working with um, what will be by the end of this year about 30 U.S. regions around the country and several international regions for, on co-producing policy and practice that relate to these themes. Um, we're exploring how metropolitan areas and regions that have common industry clusters might be able to relate to each other in sort of global trade partnerships. So um, the way that Sister Cities tries to identify sort of on the social educational diplomatic exchange and commonalities between places, uh, we're focusing entirely on this economic partnership and where it makes sense for business community and elected officials to, um, to collaborate and see if there can be cultivation of trade that benefits and, and, collabor and integration that benefits both sides. So Chicago, Mexico City is one common industry, certain common industry clusters, particularly around IT and, and uh, bio life sciences, a lot of cultural affinity, huge Mexican immigrant population in Chicago, um, a lot of common uh, multinational corporate headquarters shared between the two. And so we're trying to figure out whether um, there can be very operational action, uh, action-oriented collaboration between those two cities. Portland is also doing this. And, and I'll, I'll be honest with you, Chicago and Mexico City are very complicated places. And it will take a long time to work through how that growth model might, might happen. Mexico City, they signed a, uh, the, member, the mayor signed a memorandum of understanding. Mexico City came to Chicago a couple of weeks ago, and we started that process. The um, immediate result is actually that there is a collaboration between the business accelerators in Chicago and in Mexico City to link up the entrepreneurs working in those them when they have common interests and trying to cultivate a trade between those entrepreneurs and potentially access to each other's markets in that way, which is an interesting model and we'll see if it works. Um, second tier cities like Portland, Oregon, 
are doing this with other second tier cities in Brazil and in Asia and trying to identify, particularly for Portland, around a very deliberate sustainability sector, uh, how those trade relationships might work. Um, Mayor Nutter recently went to Tel Aviv, and there are enormous um, potential collaboration opportunities between Philadelphia's economy and Tel Aviv around life sciences, um, the kinds of research that universities are doing. And so identifying who your global economic partners are and trying to connect with them is something that we'll see how it evolves. I mean, intuitively and based on the data, it makes a lot of sense. In practice, how you actually accomplish that and whether there are tangible results that you can measure over a period of time, it's just starting, so we'll have to see. But many of these places are in the developing world, I assume. Mm -hmm. And that's an audience also that DevEx, of course, tries to cater towards. Uh, we're the largest online database and the largest platform, really, for the global development community. Now, what would you tell those people working in development, the multilaterals, the bilateral aid agencies, the Save the Children's of the World, NGOs, consulting firms uh, that are building roads, building schools, and so on and so forth? What's your message uh, to them? Well, you know, it's this, this issue about transferability between what we're experiencing in the United States and other parts of the world is a real challenge. And I think, just as in the United States, transferability between Louisville and Phoenix is a challenge, right? There are different organizations, there are different politics, the, the boundaries of local jurisdictions, what the state capacities are versus what the authorities and even on tax and other issues um, that drive a lot of these activities are very different within the U.S. But we do have a, a common federalist framework with a lot of power invested in our localities. Um, that's very different. So when we went to Sao Paulo, or we go to Carretero in Mexico City, and in Mexico where you've got, you know, you, until recently the mayors are, are elected for three years and you can't run again, that creates a very different kind of environment about how you relate to re these regional economies. Um, we find some more commonality if you go toward Europe and in fact, we're starting to work with some UK cities around this, and they've already independently been doing things like Sheffield created their own regional export strategy. Um, but in relating to these international places where we're visiting and holding roundtables and, and bringing US uh, experiences, um, trying to develop these connections, we're seeing that there is a, a lot of interest uh, by those international regions on how do you start within their own framework to approach a metropolitan economic strategy. When we were in Sao Paulo, they just created in the region a sort of um, uh, quasi-governmental jurisdictional, which had more capacity to bring it together at the sub-national level and focus on that e region, particularly around Santos and, and, and uh, the surrounding areas, Santos and the port. Um, we're seeing the same thing in Mexico City, which does have uh, sort of independent authority, um, almost like a state authority in, in Mexico historically. But looking at what Chicago did around a, what they call a metropolitan business plan, a regional economic development strategy, and replicating that. Um, I think that for the development organizations, just at, at the U.S. Conference of Mayors in Dallas uh, about two, three weeks ago, um, the Internet American Development Bank brought in local leaders, about 14 mayors from the Caribbean, Latin America, different size cities, different economies, and connected them with some U.S. mayors to talk about how do you approach these issues on economic development, on infrastructure investment and connectivity, which represents you, um, some aspects of global fluency, um, and to cultivate those potential trade relationships. Um, so the the, the convening power, the recognition and the presence, sort of the federal government's role, of where these opportunities are and trying to link up places that might have common issues, uh, that's one area. And then just the kinds of investments and activities that the organizations are doing. Not all of them are relevant to this theme. There are lots of important themes to deal with in terms of education and, and fundamental infrastructure. It's hard to talk to a place that doesn't have electricity and, you know, and, and, and basic water infrastructure about their global connectivity, right? So we recognize that places are in different spots, but there are the kinds of uh, the, the, the mindset or the, um, where there is an appropriate capacity in these regions around the world to encourage them to think about their can potential connections and, and just the approach on economic development. I don't think this is a 
again, a universal issue. This is um, about places that are reasonably or developing or reasonably well developed, have capacity, and that we can engage with on an economic basis, um, building on you know models that sister cities has in dealing on this kind of social and uh, and educational exchange. Interesting. Well, speaking about engagement, um, I'm sure you guys all have a lot of questions here. Um, hopefully, we've gotten some over Twitter as well. I'm right over um, here. There's so a microphone right in the back. And because people are um, tuning in from online, would love for you guys, if you have questions, to come here. So we have a question from Twitter. Um, how can small businesses help city become a global, a global city? Small businesses, well, small and medium-sized businesses, and I'll package those together because it's very important to, to think about medium-sized businesses. There's a huge policy and uh, gap and, and, and lack of focus on those kinds of companies. Um, it's really about engaging with the process, and um, that sounds very think tank-like, so I'll try to, I'll try to be more, more operational and specific. Um, what we're trying to encourage is, and providing a lot of tools on this. We're encouraging regions domestically and some internationally to just strategize about this and create an operational plan for how they're going to be more globally engaged. The starting point has been exports, because at least in the United States, we have not been export focused. We're a nation of under-exporters. Um, so the entry point was around an export plan Regional, so it cuts across these issues about stealing each other's businesses, exports, everybody can benefit, we're not competing for FDI. Um, and work with the small businesses and the mid-sized businesses about what they need in order to be connected into the international economy. The starting point, we put out a, a 10 steps guide, another 10 steps, everything works in 10s. 10 steps guide on creating one of these export plans so that Regions can undertake this effort on their own. But the, the starting point is a market assessment. And that involves data, but also interviews, surveys, focus groups with the private sector to understand those that are exporting, what they could have used or what they find most beneficial, and those that are not exporting, why they're not exporting, and what the barriers are. There's very common issues here for small businesses and medium-sized businesses in particular. There's fear. There's a lack of recognition of market opportunities and the value of doing this because you know it's a lot easier for somebody in Phoenix to sell to Albuquerque than it is to sell to Mexico. They think, right? Um, and then it's about uh, so it's about about creating some local momentum and interest in this. Small business owners, medium-sized business owners don't have a lot of time to invest. They don't have a lot of time to invest in public processes, and they don't have a lot of time to invest, which is why they don't, in thinking about even exporting to new markets. They take what they have to operate now. Um, there's 4%, based on the National Center for the Middle Market, 4% of businesses, uh, middle market businesses in the United States are even thinking about could they go international in any way. Um, so there's a there's a role for small and mid-sized businesses to help motivate this effort and then to engage in it. Um, and that the, uh, the, I would almost flip that and say that the economic development professionals, the elected leadership need to actually be engaging small and medium-sized businesses proactively and giving them the venue to think about how they can export and then giving them the resources that are identified that they need in order to engage in, in international trade. We have two minutes left for this session, so now is your time to ask if you're in the audience. Any questions? <coughs> do you want to come up? Sorry to do that to you. Yeah, we're in a World Trade Center, and I was just wondering, are World Trade Centers, or hundreds of them all over, the, all over the world, are cities making effective use of their World Trade Centers? And if not, how can World Trade Centers be more effective in, in making cities be more global? Right, well, it depends on the place. And the World Trade Centers, just like any other organization, seem to have varying levels of ca uh, capacity. Um, in many cases, it's, uh, it, it, they are, it, it, in all the places that we are working with, they are involved in some way. You know. Um, in some communities, World Trade Centers are more about 
um, the facility, the real estate, and the labeling of being a World Trade Center than they are about providing particular services to support um, export or trade and foreign investment activities. So it depends. Um, I'll try and give a uh, particular example in, in order to kind of include this and bring that in about what organizations are involved. And I'll use the Portland as one because there are some very specific actions that kind of capture this and, and results from it. So in Portland, um, which is you know a mid-sized city and not necessarily internationally known, um, Portland went through this process of figuring out how they should be more globally engaged and working and working in collaboration with us. They brought together um, the mayors of the, the region and then brought in the business community and went through the process I described in terms of an export strategy, uh, market assessment, figuring out where there were gaps and, and redundancies in service delivery and supports, what their businesses needed. Um, they came down to identifying five key industry clusters in, that are part of their economic development strategy and that are, that are, are uh, important to Portland. But they determined in looking at their global identity and global brand that if you knew Portland, you knew it because it was a green city. It's a sustainability. And that's one of their key industry clusters that had been developed because of the political ethos there and regulatory environment and investment in making Portland more sustainable. Um, so it created lots of architectural design, engineering, software technology for energy efficiency. Um, the, only, the only domestic manufacturer of streetcars is in Portland. Um, and then politically, Portland had been involved in international efforts really around energy and sustainability. Big, uh, big effort in the C40. Um, so people around the world started to recognize Portland for being green and involved in these international activities around green. And Brazil, Mexico, China, all dealing with these urbanization issues and growth issues, had been visiting Portland to see, well, how did Portland do it? Um, they had never organized anything around sustainability in terms of their international engagement or economically. And so they identified that uh, they could interact with international markets and help their small and medium-sized businesses by focusing on that. They brought in the World Trade Center, they brought in corporate interests, and they branded this as We Build Green Cities. And they pull, pulled together across sectors, services and goods, um, these kinds of companies. They undertook a marketing or, or global brand, a global identity uh, effort, which is one of the 10, 10 traits of global fluency, to project that image. And then instead of saying, who wants to go to China this year? We're all going to China. That's a big market that's growing. They said, we're going to target a particular market with these <laughs> kinds of companies that we identified for funding, uh, for, because of, of funding, regulatory environment, market demand is right for the sustainability sector that, that, that we have to offer. They went to Japan post-tsunami, um, not a developing country, and they determined there's a great market opportunity here. They worked with the Japanese, who respected what Portland had to bring as their comparative international asset. And they, within six to nine months, have <coughs> contracts, which is one of those situations where you say, advertised on TV, not applicable to everyone. That's a remarkably rapid turnaround for a trade mission to actually execute deals. And they developed with, uh, with the Japanese um, a new partnership where the Japanese companies that are more, uh, more global are helping and working with those Portland companies, particularly in architectural and design and engineering, to access additional markets. <coughs> That's the kind of more deliberate global engagement strategy that a smaller community can have if they think about what they're doing. And then now they're working on foreign direct investment and other issues and transportation infrastructure needs of their companies in order to have a comprehensive global city approach. So if Portland can do it, then anybody can do it.